So Galatians, uh, this is uh, uh, Galatians for Beginners. This is lesson number nine, the last one in this series. The title of this uh, lesson is A Call to Live in Freedom. And we're going to begin at uh, Galatians chapter five in verse one. So as a review, we know, we have said that this epistle was originally written as an effort to turn a church away from its fall into legalism. That was the problem. Uh, let's take a look at legalism, a bit of a definition in Romans chapter 9, verse 30. Um, Paul explains the basic error of legalism. So let's read that chapter 9 in Romans. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So he's saying uh, Gentiles, even uh, religious ones, uh, uh, did not pursue holiness and purity as the Jews did. And yet they captured the blessings and the Jews didn't capture the blessings. Why is that? Paul asks you know, uh, rhetorically at the beginning of this passage. Well, here's the reason. The Jews were pursuing the law which in itself was righteous. In other words, the law was pure and it was good and the law was perfect, okay? It was a righteous thing, but the law did not and could not impart righteousness. It, couldn't get, it itself was righteous, but it couldn't make you righteous. That was the problem with it. The Gentiles, however, captured the righteousness that saves because they pursued it from the starting point of faith, faith in Christ. So the Jews lost the righteousness that saves because they rejected Christ as the starting point. And they chose instead to try to capture or possess righteousness by capturing or possessing the law instead. In other words, doing and becoming right by obeying the law perfectly. That was the method that they chose instead of coming through Christ. The Gentiles were united to Christ by faith. Now when I say faith, faith that includes trust and obedience, and that obedience initially expressed in repentance and baptism. And so they were united to Christ by faith and so gained the blessings of salvation earned for them by Jesus. He earns all the blessings, how? By obeying the law perfectly. He does that, he succeeds at that. And the Gentiles accessed all of those blessings not by living perfect lives, but by being united to Jesus through faith. The Jews, as I mentioned, tried to unite themselves to the law through perfect obedience, hoping that the qualities that the law possessed would, would then be theirs, and they were mistaken. So the Judaizers, those are the people in the church at the time who were causing this problem. The Judaizers wanted the Galatians to attempt to gain righteousness through union with the law and express that union through circumcision and other things, but beginning with circumcision. So in chapters five and six, Paul makes a final plea for them, meaning the Galatians, for the Galatians to reject this system and remain firmly united to Jesus through the faith system. All right, so there's a little introduction. Let's start uh, chapter five, verses one to four. He says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under uh, obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, 
you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So Paul exhorts them to remain united to Jesus, telling them that to unite themselves to the law through circumcision will effectively sever them from Christ. In other words, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Christ gives the blessings of salvation freely, but those seeking them from the law must pay the price of perfect obedience to gain these blessings. All right, so he continues in verse Five and six, he says, for we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. So those united to Christ by faith, they have a true hope of righteousness and their works are not to obtain righteousness, but rather their expressions of love motivated by faith. That's what he's saying here. Yeah, we're, we're, we're living righteous lives, we're doing our best, we're, you know, but we're doing this as a result of our love and our faith in Christ, not as an attempt to, to be perfect and to earn our salvation. And therein lies the essential difference between these two systems. Legalism produces good works and moral lifestyles and a pious attitude, but the motivation is pride. You know, God will give me righteousness because of the good that I do. I earn it. I'm a good person. Therefore, I should be treated as a good person. Therefore, God should accept me as a good person. But Isaiah the prophet says you know, that our righteousness, man's righteousness, is as filthy rags in front of God. Whatever we think that we are as good, the reason that we think that is that we really don't see ourselves. And Isaiah says, if you really saw yourself, you, you wouldn't be boasting about how good you are or how righteous you are. So legalism basically motivated by pride. Faith produces exactly the same kinds of results, except the motivation is gratitude for mercy because of one's sins. Faith motivated by love for God because He first loves us. So legalism fails because it can't produce a loving heart. And a loving heart is the very image of God. You know, we're, <clears throat> we're being transformed into the image of God. Well, the image of God is, is a loving heart. That's the image of God. God is love, right? The law can't do that. Rule keeping does not produce that in a person. So the exhortation not to abandon faith for legalism uh, this is what he does, and he even you know, adds a reproach on those who would lead them in this direction and a reminder, he wasn't the one. This was not his idea. He didn't teach him this way. So we keep going, verse seven to 10. <clears throat> he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Uh, he says, I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. So he wonders, you know, who led them astray after such a good start? And he voices an opinion that he believes that they will, you know, he says, I still have confidence in you that you're not going to you know, fall apart here. You're not going to buy into this thing. I still have confidence in you. This legalism, this is not of Christ. And those who promote it work among them like leaven, obviously a warning to those who are teaching this to be uh, careful. He also makes a warning to the one who is advocating this view that God will judge him for this. So you Galatians, you be careful. You're being influenced here. Pay attention. And you, the person or persons that are doing this thing, you better be careful because God will judge you for having taught this. Verse 11 and 12. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Boy, talk about harsh. <laughs> it seems, between the lines here, it seems the suggestion had been made that Paul also was preaching circumcision by the Judaizers. In other words, the Judaizers were saying, you know, Paul, he's teaching the same thing as us. 
You know, that's the suggestion apparently that was being made to the Galatians you know, to get them on board with this. So Paul answers this. He responds to this. He says, if I'm teaching what you know, they say I'm teaching, why am I still being persecuted by these people if I'm doing what they're doing? And then secondly, he says, uh, uh, if he does, then what purpose is the cross? Because if by an act of human merit we can be accepted by God, what do we need the cross for? I mean, either Jesus earns it all for us or nothing. Again, you can't have it both ways. And then Paul suggests that if the Judaizers really want to outdo him, which was, this was going on, we're better than he is, so on and so forth, um, they wanted to show their religious zeal and they were much more zealous than he was. So he says if they want to show their zeal so badly, he says they should go all the way and castrate themselves. That's what I'm saying, pretty, pretty harsh stuff here. Perhaps this would impress the Galatians on their zeal and their sincerity. So in verse one of chapter six, Paul equates union with Christ uh, with freedom. So he's talked about righteousness and the Holy Spirit and power and sonship and all these things come to us based on our union with Jesus. So he adds one more thing here. He says, in addition to all of these things, freedom, that also is based on our faith. And in the next couple of verses, he explains that Christian freedom doesn't mean license to be immoral. Freedom, he says, maturity, brings with it responsibility and accountability. And he explains what freedom in Christ actually means. So in verses 13 to 15, he writes, for you were called to freedom. So there's the freedom, remember? He's talked about by faith, you've received the spirit, you've received righteousness, you know, you've received all these things. Now he says, for you were called to freedom. That's another thing that you've received, all right, uh, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So we're united to the one who came on earth to serve, not to be served. We are free to serve others in the name of the Lord and reap the rewards of satisfaction and joy and peace that comes from service. We were originally created to serve and that is our most natural and fulfilling activity. And you know, because we're heading into this period, you know, the summertime, I, I, I think about VBS. I mean, VBS is always you know, panic mode. <laughs> you know, we, we always think we have a lot of time to get VBS organized and then all of a sudden it's upon us. You know? And there's so much to do and all the people that work, uh, we've, we've often said that the VBS project that lasts four or five days uses up or uses more individuals in the church than any other single program. There are literally dozens and dozens of people that are involved. And everybody's here early and they stay late and the, it's nine o'clock and the kids are running around the building and then they're coming, they, they miss their naps, they go to bed too late, they're, they're eating sugar and drinking Kool-Aid and you know, I mean it's, it's you know, and by the last night, which is a Wednesday night, I mean it's a nut house, you know, I mean the kids are so wired and everybody's exhausted and everything, but it's a tired, uh, excuse me, it's a happy exhaustion. It's a happy exhaustion. It's like, yeah, we did it. It was good. You know? I mean, I, I missed sleep. I, I was late for work. The kids are driving me. But there's a sense of joy and accomplishment. Why? Because everything that was done, all the service that was rendered, it was rendered because of faith in Christ. Why, why else do it? Why, 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 why else do such a thing like that? such an inconvenient thing. So there's great joy that comes from service. And that's what Paul is, is talking about here. Before, he says, we served sin and we served self and, and we served the devil. Now, he says, we're free to serve God and others and the kingdom. So all service in and out of the kingdom that is done in Jesus' name is holy. Any service offered without regard to Jesus 
will simply perish with this world. So there's a lot of good things going on in the world. People build hospitals and do this and that, so on and so forth, with no reference to Christ, not as a basis of faith, simply because it's a good thing to do. And you know what? It is a good thing to do, and it does serve people, the, 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 but the, in the long run, that thing, that good service, that you know, humanitarian deed, well, it'll just end when the world ends, period. You know, it'll, it'll perish when the world perish. The promise of Christ is whatever good you do in the name of Jesus will survive this world, will be a testimony of your faith before the throne of God. So freedom, he says, means service. It also means fruitfulness. Oh, there we go, fruitfulness. So in verse 16 he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So freedom means that we are now able to bear fruit that will last forever because we are no longer separated from God. We're no longer you know, cursed to be destroyed along with everything else that uh, has been built by us or, uh, or others, whether it's good or bad. So the key, he says here, is to walk after the Spirit. How do we walk after the Spirit? Well, you obey God's word. Just another way of saying it. He could have said, so uh, obey God's word, but he says it, so walk after the Spirit. How, how are those things the same? Well, who gives us the word? Well, the Spirit of God. This is the Spirit of God. This is Him speaking, the Spirit of God. So if I walk after the Spirit or if I obey God's word, that's the same thing, all right? Just two different ways of saying the same thing. So the key is to walk after the Spirit. And in so doing, he says, we will bear the everlasting marks of the Holy Spirit. Let's face it, if we obey the Spirit, we're going to become like the Spirit. So the marks of the Spirit are evident in a person's character and they cannot be denied. That's why he says you know, there's no law against this. There's no accusation against this. If you bear the works of the flesh more consistently than the fruit of the Spirit, well then it's obvious that you don't walk after the Spirit and you won't inherit the kingdom. That's his point. So we're free to follow the Spirit as Christians and Christ has now given us His Spirit but we are capable of rejecting Him if we want to, and whether we do or not is evident in our character. It can be seen. The things that we say and the things that we do, what do we tell our, our kids? You know, uh, watch what people do. You want, you, you want to judge something? The fruit of it. What fruit does it produce? What fruit does that person produce? What are the results of a, a certain system you know, that's, how you, that's how you judge something. So uh, Paul is saying here, if your life produces worldly sinful things, well then you're a worldly sinful person. If your life is producing fruit uh, more consistently and more often than the works of the flesh, you know, it'd be nice if it was all black and white, but we know that it's a combination of both, right? It's a combination of both. We're always struggling with the flesh. The, it, you know, uh, Paul says you know, the, 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 the flesh can't do what it wants because of the spirit and the spirit can't do what it wants all the time because of the flesh. That's the struggle that we're in because we're human beings. Here he's talking about what you produce, the sum total of what you produce. 
If the sum total of what you produce is greater uh, in following the Spirit, well then that tells you the direction that you're following in your life. So freedom permits and promotes one other thing he talks about and that is uh, fellowship. So freedom in Christ means service, fruitfulness, and the third one is fellowship, chapter six. He says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself but each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So in Acts chapter two, we see that church growth was a result of the sharing of responsibilities for one another in the body, as well as reaching out to others. You know, as the church is growing there in Acts 2, people were uh, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship. You, know, you, you could see the church growing because people were interacting. They were integrated into one another, serving one another. So here, Paul encourages them to be generous with one, or, uh, with one another. Generosity, usually a, a good indicator of one's grasp of God's mercy. Those who love and give little in proportion to their means usually have little insight uh, to how much God loves them. If they did, they'd give more. You know, we, we, we give of ourselves more the more we know God. And so the problem isn't, oh, that guy's cheap, or it isn't that. The problem is that person does, does, does not really know who God is. Because if he did or she did, their attitude would be different. This is why the ministry of teaching God's word so that people will know God more perfectly, that affects not just the brain, it affects conduct. The more I know God, the more I want to know Him. The more I know Him, the more I want to do what He wants me to do and vice versa. The less I know him or the less I want to do what he wants me to do. And so Paul encourages generosity. Generosity towards sinners and backsliders. You know, at the very beginning he says, you know, if someone's caught in a trespass, be gentle. You know, go to them gently. They've made a mistake. They've slipped. They've failed. Don't, don't you know, judge and pound on them. Help them. Uh, generosity towards the preachers and the teachers. Those in the church whose devotion to the word and to the church is, is, um, is a full-time uh, uh, ministry. Generosity to all those who are in need. So it's not, you know, it's not easy to give in any one of these areas, but how one does um, is a good measure of one's sense of freedom in Christ, because a generous spirit is a free spirit. A generous spirit is a free spirit. Because I'm free in Christ, he enables me to be generous. So uh, there's the, the end of the, the, the teaching part about the things that we have through faith in Christ. In uh, chapter six, verses 11 to 18, he'll give a final warning and uh, a final salutation. So first of all, the final words. So there's a warning against the circumcision party that he that he gives, he says, see with what large letters I am writing to you uh, with my own hands. So here Paul writes with his own hand. And the reason he says that is that most of his letters were dictated to another person. So when he writes bold, large letters, probably means that he's writing for emphasis. Some people say, well, he's writing large letters because he has vision problems. Others He's writing boldly because he wants people to know this is his signature. He is making sure they notice 
that he is you know, the author of this um, particular letter with the signature. Then he goes on, verse 12, he says, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And those who will walk by, his, uh, by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So he reveals that the Judaizers are basically cowards who want the prestige of religious leadership without the risk, without the risk. Why do you think, why do you think when the church you know, is considering uh, men to be elders, they look into their lives, and yes, you know, the church wants men who are upstanding and so on and so forth you know, uh, in their married lives, and their family lives, but they're also looking for men who are already busy serving. You don't, you, don't, you don't give the eldership to an individual with the hope that they'll begin serving. No, you, you give it to somebody who's already serving, who's already involved in people's lives, who's already carrying a load. You give it to that person because that person uh, is already willing to pay the price of leadership. That's who you give it to. So to preach the cross you know, uh, on the, the other side of the ledger, to preach the cross, to serve the church is tiring, it's demanding, it's risky, it's unpopular. Legalism, circumcision, as far as this group was concerned, that was the safe route. And, 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 and it places all the burden on the Galatians. None on the teachers who did not even try to live by the tenets of legalism which was perfect law keeping. In other words, he says about these Judaizers, they want you to do stuff, but they themselves won't do any of it. They're hypocrites. Well, you know, it's the same thing. You can extrapolate that to the modern day church. You don't want leaders in the modern day church who want the church to do stuff, but they themselves don't do anything. Well, of course not. You don't want that in any organization. You don't want that if you're working in a school, right? The principals got all kinds of rules and laws and this and that, reports they want, but they, you know, they, don't, they don't do any of this stuff. They're not there to help, they're not there to support. In the military, right? You want your commanders to be out there, to take a risk, to be with their men. So it's the same thing. He's saying these guys, they, they love the prestige of religious leadership, but they won't lift, you know, they won't lift the burden. They won't even keep the rules they're, they're, they're placing on, on your back. So Paul says that his boast is not in his converts. He doesn't boast, hey, look at all the people I baptized. That's not what he boasts in. His boast is what the cross has done for him. And his point is the cross has revealed my sinfulness and my lostness, but it has also revealed my salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what I boast in. I boast in what the cross has done for me. Circumcision or no circumcision, that doesn't change you. Christ changes you when you're united to Him and God blesses all those who are changed by His Son Jesus. So circumcision, you know, it was a sign of the promise to come to the Jews. Jesus was the one who was to come and in Him all the promises are fulfilled. That's why you don't need circumcision anymore. It's, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And then he gives a, a final farewell, verses 17 and 18. He says, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. So he doesn't want any more accusations, and he lets the scars that he has borne for Christ be a witness for his defense. And we know, right, he was, he, you know, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was imprisoned, you know, he suffered, and so on and so forth. So he says, all those actual marks on his body, you know, the times he was whipped, the times he received 39 lashes, I mean, those left scars on his body. He says, you know what? Just take a look at the scars on my body. Let that do the talking. That's my defense. 
That's my justification for who I am and, and what I do and for my sincerity. I'm willing to suffer for the faith. I'm willing to suffer for the gospel, he says. You know, we need to think, you know, do we have any scars? Do we have any scars for Christ? What are our scars for Christ? What have we borne for Him? Any suffering or disadvantage, inconvenience, denial, because we're disciples? We ought to be able to make maybe not the same boast with the same degree as Paul did, because man, that guy was beaten a lot. I don't think I could survive one 39 lashing, let alone how many three that he suffered. But do we have some scars? Could we say, here's a scar, here's an emotional scar? Can we say that? And then he, he gives a final blessing uh, to them, uh, that Christ be with their spirit. So with the little bit of time that we've got left, I just want to share three things Galatians has taught us, you know, takeaways that we need to you know, keep. Lesson number one, Galatians teaches us about faith. And here's the thing about faith. It has always been God's method of transferring blessings. All blessings, everything has always been based on faith. Everything you have from God is based on faith in Him. Now the response is different. Some, somebody built a boat, somebody left this home. Uh, today we're, we're baptized. You know, there's always a kind of response but it's always the same thing, faith. And I've told uh, my uh, children as they were growing up and we talked about religious things, uh, you, know, you try to kind of squeeze it down to one lesson many times and I, I've always said to them, um, in your life, everything is always about faith. You're looking for a job, it's about faith. You're getting married, it's about faith. You're having trouble in your marriage, it's about faith. You got illness, it's about faith. You have a difficult child, it's about faith. You got a sick child, it's about faith. It's always, 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 always about faith. It's as if God picks us up every once in a while and He dunks us into the fire you know, and He looks it up and He looks at us in the light to see hmm, you know, what, needs to, what needs to be shaved off, what needs to be sanded down, what rough edge here, what, can I, what needs to happen here. And we always forget that. We run, all, you know, we run around panicky and, we, and then finally maybe we, we come to our senses and we say, well may, maybe I ought to pray and, and please don't ever say that in my presence. You know? But don't ever say, well might as well pray. It can't hurt. <laughs> don't ever say that. <laughs> so it's always about faith and I say that to all of you. It's always about faith. Lesson number two, all spiritual blessings are only available in Jesus Christ. Some have more earthly blessings without Christ, but nobody has heavenly blessings without Christ. All spiritual blessings only available in Him. Why, why, do, why did I go into ministry? You know, why me? Why, why wasn't it some of you? Why wasn't it the guy? You know, I went to school with guys and some of them became lawyers and others went into business. Why, why am I the guy that had to go into ministry? Why me and not you? In my case, it was because I really believed that the only way for spiritual blessings to happen was through Christ. And the question I could not answer and I couldn't get around was, somebody has to tell people that. Somebody has to do that job. That was what drove me, pushed me to become a preacher. Because I felt so many people had no clue about how to actually get to heaven. They just didn't know. They didn't even want to hear it. All spiritual blessings only available through Jesus Christ. Third lesson and final lesson is about freedom. 
We are free from condemnation. Yes, that's the good news. But we are also free for other things, but not sinful things. We're free to serve and free to give and free to grow and free to love. We have freedom. I told you last week, I would never go back to Catholicism. Why? Because that's prison. <laughs> that's, like going back, that's like going to jail. It's one of the most precious gifts that we have in Christ. Freedom, freedom. So Galatians should be an empowering book that frees us from slavery to any system that promises to make us better or perfect, any system that says that it'll enable us to serve God better. Galatians enables us to serve God freely and enthusiastically based on our gratitude, not on our guilt. If you know this book, if you know this book, no one can enslave you to any philosophy or religion ever again, ever again. Never happen if you know this book. All right, that's the end. Thank you for bearing with me for these nine, these nine weeks. Over and out. Thank you.